This is a resource of Just Loving God. How to pray. Praying the Scriptures. I wanted to just give you something tonight that I think will help you. How many, be honest, how many of you here, honestly, find prayer difficult? Honestly, if you're just being really honest. And sometimes you come to pray and it's just like, man, I, I don't know what to pray. I don't know. I pray, but it doesn't really feel like I'm getting through. I don't know, you know. And I have to say that's a recurring theme uh, in the church globally. It is a problem. I think it's really important to be practical. At the end of the day, people want to know how to do stuff. They know they ought to do stuff, but they're not quite sure how sometimes. So I wanted to just give you this little sermonette on praying the scriptures. And so very quickly, why do I want to talk about prayer? Well, because first of all, it will help you to pray. And that's the primary objective. I want you to be able to pray. And I don't mean saying prayers. I say this all the time, but I hope that it's beginning to sink in. Saying prayers is completely useless. We're not called to say prayers. We are called to pray. We are called to actually enter into a relationship with our maker where he speaks to us and we know we're speaking to him. We know he hears. We know we have an audience in the throne room of grace and his Holy Spirit speaks to us and witnesses inside. So I want you to be able to pray. I mean, really pray. And this should help you to eliminate any excuses as well for prayer, because that's a fruit of struggling to pray. We then start making excuses not to. So this will help you to remove those. And the wonderful thing, if you can get this, this will really help you to take delight in prayer. How many of you would love every single day to just long that you cannot wait to get to prayer? Wouldn't that be amazing if you could just feel that every day? You just couldn't wait to pray instead of, oh, I need to pray. I know I ought to pray and I should pray. And pray is, prayer is good. And prayer, I know God hears, but I don't really want to. So I want it to be a delight. And prayer is vital. We look all through scripture and we see how prayer is vital. It's a form of serving God. If you look at old Anna in the temple around the time of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, she was, she was serving the Lord in prayers all the time, continuously. We're commanded to pray in Philippians 4. Christ himself exemplified prayer, and he was God. The apostles, the early church prayed, and God means prayer to be the method by which he answers us, by which he speaks to us. Prayer is to help us in major decisions. Prayer is to help us with demonic oppression or opposition. We're told to pray that he would send laborers, harvesters out to harvest souls. Praying strengthens us. When we really pray, the times that you have really prayed and you've really connected with God, you've come away strong. You've come away full. You've come away able and equipped. So notice that. But it don't, doesn't just strengthen you. It also strengthens those you're praying for. It's also to teach us persistence. And it's to teach us faith. And it's to teach us trust in God. Jesus actually delays answering prayers deliberately so that we learn to persist and trust and have faith. And prayer shows that we actually believe that God is. It shows that we believe God exists because he that comes to God must believe that he exists, but also that he rewards those who seek him diligently. So prayer also shows that we have a basic faith in someone and that he is our advocate and he stands as a representative of us in heaven. And we always have a hearing before the throne of grace. So when we come to pray and we really begin to understand this, we begin to know that we have an audience with the king of all kings. This changes your desire to pray. It also helps us pray, of course, discerning God's will for our lives. And here's a guarantee. Unprayed prayers are unanswered prayers. You have not because you ask not. It's a very simple little equation. God says, ask me. Come and ask me. See if I 
will bless you. I will. I will answer you. Think of blind Bartimaeus. What if he had stopped praying? Because that was praying. What if he'd stopped? He'd have sat outside Jericho for the rest of his days blind. But also prayer helps you in groups as well, in group prayer, not just individually, because it does a number of things. It unifies us. When we pray together, we feel unity of the spirit, unity of the faith. We also are inviting the Holy Spirit's power to come when we pray in a group. Think of the upper room. They were waiting on God. They were praying, seeking God expectantly. We have God's promise that he will answer. It builds faith. It builds humility. It builds thanksgiving and, and worship when we pray together because we hear other people's thanksgiving. There's also very often confession of sin. The Holy Spirit moves us to say, I'm struggling with this. I, I've gone astray. Will you pray for me? This is powerful. This is important. It often leads to intercession where you're standing in the gap for someone else who maybe is too weak, too tired, or doesn't even know their maker. Praying in a group also expands our vision of other people's needs. And this is really important because we get very self-centered. We look at ourselves and what we need. And it encourages the other people in the group that we're praying for, because we might be praying for them. It's powerful when they hear other people in the room praying for them. And of course, Jesus prayed publicly. He prayed in a group very often. And he still does. He prays for us continuously uh, in heaven in front of all the angels and that great cloud of witnesses. So public prayer is very important. And of course, the Holy Spirit is continuously in us, praying unutterable groans that we can't speak, but he is longing and seeking and drawing and yearning for us. And of course, when we pray in a group, we also, we get revelation not just on our own, but together we get revelation of what God's will is. And of course, the apostles did it. Think of Acts chapter four, where they, the room where they were was shaken when they all prayed together. They didn't go off and pray individually when they heard the threats of the rulers. They prayed together and it was powerful. And then one other thought is scripture is the basis for all that we live through and live by everything that we ground our life on. The truth is scriptural. It's all based in scripture, the word of God. This is the gospel that was once delivered to the saints. Hasn't been changed, never will be changed. It is complete. It is sufficient in all respects. And our life is built on that. The early church, very often when they prayed and preached, they preached the Old Testament because that's what they had at the beginning. And when we look at the early worship, the singing of the early church, we see also that they were basically singing so much of the Old Testament. At the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples sang a hymn, probably from the Hallel, but between Psalms 115 and 118, which was often sung at the Passover. Paul, of course, encouraged the believers to sing in Corinth and Colossae and Ephesus. He encouraged us there to sing Psalms, you notice psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so the the scriptures were informing their worship in fact they were forming the basis of their worship remember the lyrical songs of simeon when jesus was born and anna and mary of course they they had clear old testament references and overtones and themes and also of course almost all of the new testament hymns that we have uh, pieces of in the epistles either directly or indirectly they are all speaking of Christ. So here's another guide stone for prayer and worship. They're based on scripture and they speak of Christ. They talk about who Christ was. We see these little doxologies in Paul's writings. They just suddenly, he, he just suddenly explode into praise when he's writing. And some of these were established sayings or clearly probably hymns that the early church was singing. So what Christ did, they were focused on that. We have the songs of Mary, of course, and Zechariah and others at the birth of Christ that were about the Savior, notice. They weren't about, you know, the state of the world. They weren't about how they felt. <laughs> they were about the Savior. They were about the work of God in redemption. And of course, Revelation, the book of Revelation, it's full 
of anthems and songs, all extolling the lamb who was slain. Why? Because unless the lamb was slain, we are of all men most miserable. Unless he was raised from the dead, we have no faith, we have no hope. So we will sing of these things. And of course, Paul's letters, there are several unidentified quotations in his letters. But again, they're always focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We think that many of these were actually hymns. Uh, we see them in Philippians 2, Romans 11, Colossians 1, 1 Timothy 1. They're dotted throughout. So all of this to say, Scripture and Christ, who is the subject of Scripture. End of discussion. Those who say Christ's story cannot be seen in the Old Testament, you are profoundly in error. Christ is the purpose. He is the end. He is the culmination of all of the law. He is the type and the shadow. He is everything from Genesis to Revelation. And so all of prayer and worship must be centered around Scripture and Christ. So I just wanted to help you with this. I hope this will help. Scripture, of course, is in multiple genres. So we have different types of writing in Scripture. We have a uh, narrative, which simply tells what happened. It's just a history. And uh, the, the author of that particular narrative has a purpose and a reason for writing in the way they did to the specific audience they're writing to. And so we see narrative sections. We also see wisdom literature, like Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes. And of course, these are collections of wise sayings that have a moral and ethical purpose uh, that the reader is then to apply into their life. Then we have prophecy, and we have multiple books of the Bible which are prophecy, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the 12 minor prophets. So that is a genre where God is speaking through a person who is a prophet, and God is directly speaking, dictating in some cases to the prophet what to say for a specific purpose. And then, of course, we have gospels. So gospels are a, a genre in their own right. They're not just a narrative. They're a narrative with proclamation. These are written by people whose lives have been transformed by the subject of the gospel, Christ. And so they're writing not just a history, but also a proclamation. And then within the gospels, of course, we have another genre, which is parables, which Jesus used, of course, uh, and these, of course, uh, speak in types again and shadows. Then the, uh, another uh, genre we have is epistles. And so of the 27 New Testament books, 21 of those are epistles or letters. And these are what we might call occasioned texts. They're written for a specific occasion to a specific person or persons for a specific reason. And then we have apocalyptic literature. And uh, this, of course, like Revelation, parts of Daniel and Joel, Zechariah, Isaiah, Amos, uh, Micah. And uh, apocalypse simply means revelation. It literally means taking the lid off something so you can see what's there. And these are for warning and comfort. Uh, and uh, there's much symbolism in that genre. And then, of course, we have poetry. So there are multiple genres. But my point in all this is that when you open the pages of this precious book, at any point, you can pray what's there. And Yes, uh, when it's narrative, it's important to know the background. It's important to know why they were writing, who they were writing to, it really helps. And this is a lifelong study. So don't think you have to know all of this at once. You'll never get to the end of this book. You'll never exhaust the learning that God has for us here. So just keep studying, keep seeking more and more understanding. But when you open that uh, in narrative, you can look at the story and you can immediately see what God's doing, what God's nature is, how he's dealing with people, how people are reacting to him. And it can create longings in you and prayers in you. Well, I don't want to react like that, Lord. I, want, I don't want to do that. Or I want to do that. That's how I want to react too. That's how I want to speak. That's how I want to behave. And so you can open then at, 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 the, at the Psalms and you can open in poetry. And these are perhaps the easiest immediately to pray but if you can learn this, if you can learn to come to Scripture in any of its multifaceted wonder, whether it's apocalyptic or prophetic uh, or a parable or a narrative or poetry or whatever it is, you can pray that Scripture. Now, with narrative, it may be difficult. It might have a whole list of names for ages. It's difficult to pray the names. 
uh, unless you've read the Bible, as Nikki was saying, so well that uh, you know exactly the importance of each of those names, what they all did in the Old Testament and why they're in there. But assuming you don't know that, uh, you can get to the end of a narrative section very often and you'll see the Holy Spirit makes a point. Well, you can pray that point. You can pray the understanding of that whole passage of narrative. And so I just, want to, I just want to throw this at you so that you've got something to take away and actually put into practice now. I've obviously talked about this before, but I can guarantee that those of you who are struggling aren't doing this. So I, I want you to go away and I want you to put this into practice. So let's give you some examples quickly. Let's look at some narrative texts. Well, we've just finished our study in the book of Ruth. So that's a narrative, isn't it? It's just a story, it's a history of what happened to one girl called Ruth and a guy called Boaz and a mother-in-law called Naomi. And you, if you just open, say, to Ruth chapter three and you end up on verse nine, you know, you could pray for an hour just on this. Boaz said, who are you? And she, that's Ruth, answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. Now, if you just skim over that and you just keep reading and you just blast through because you're trying to get to the end of the book and do your reading for the day, I tell you, you miss all the gleanings, all the wheat that Boaz has deliberately left in the field for you to pick up. He's told his angels, drop huge clumps of barley and wheat for Ruth. Well, if she never went to the field, she'd never have found these gleanings, these things that had been left there. So this, wasn't, this was sort of cheating. And that's what God does for us. He cheats by giving us so much grace that we can't really fail to be blessed if we just avail ourselves of the means of grace. And that's all we have to do. He said, who are you? And just imagine, you could start praying, Lord, you asked after me, you said, who is this one? Who is she? Who is he? I'm interested in who you are. Lord, thank you that you're interested in me. I tell you, you could pray that one phrase for a whole hour. Lord, I can't believe you're interested in me. Lord, I ran from you. I defied your will. I got hurt and I, and I turned up and I curled up in a ball and I said, you're to blame. But you still came after me. You could pray that for an hour. And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Lord, I want to be your servant. I want to have this attitude in heart. I'm tired of my rebellion. I'm tired of being proud and haughty and resistant. I don't want to be. Lord, change me. I will cooperate with you. You see, you could pray for another hour for that phrase. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. Oh my goodness. I mean, you could do a year on that prayer. And he then said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. Oh my goodness, my daughter. May you be blessed by the Lord, by Yahweh. Lord, thank you for your blessing. I mean, you could just pray, couldn't you? How about another narrative section in Acts? You could just open randomly. I did this earlier. I just literally sort of opened the Bible. I went, okay, let's see if I can pray this. Acts 28, verse one. We then learned that the island was called Malta. It's not looking good, is it, for praying? <laughs> verse two. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. Hang on a minute. Lord, unusual kindness from complete strangers. Lord, I need some of that. I need some unusual kindness. I'm trying to rent a house, Lord. I need unusual kindness from a prospective landlord. Lord, I, I need unusual kindness from my boss. Father, you are my provider. Lord, you, you own the souls of every man, of every woman and every child. Lord, I ask you to turn the heart of my boss, that I might have unusual kindness, that they may warm me by the fire in the coldness of this circumstance and this rain. Lord, I know who you are. Look how you looked after Paul in the middle of a shipwreck. Look what you did, Lord. You can do that for me. Do you see? You can pray literally anything from the Bible. How about wisdom literature? Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes. James is a little bit like that. In the New Testament, it's a bit like Proverbs, a bit of wisdom literature. And uh, it's very practical wisdom literature. Deals, pra deals with practical topics. 
So I opened it, Proverbs 8. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? Verse 4, to you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. Oh, wisdom, let me not block my ears to you. Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and understanding and revelation in the knowledge of God. I want to know you. Lord, let there be such a fear and reverence of God in my heart that wisdom is truly birthed in me. Because that is the beginning of wisdom. You could pray for a week on that. You could, no, you could pray for a lifetime on that. Oh, Lord, let me be wise. Give me the wisdom that only comes from your spirit. You, the, the great father of lights, from whom comes every precious gift. I want this wisdom that's from above, not the earthy, sensual, devilish wisdom that's fleshy. I want your wisdom. So how about Job? Wisdom literature. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Oh, come quickly. The spirit and the bride say, come, Lord, come. Just like Job, Lord, my heart faints within me for you to return. Lord, come and right all the wrongs. Come and make amends, Lord, where men have destroyed all that is clean and good and holy. Come, mighty Redeemer, let me see you. Let me be resurrected on that day. I tell you, that, pray that couple of verses. Your heart will be full of faith after an hour of that. Do you see this changes? You come and say, well, I don't know what to pray for. Well, read that. Pray that. Just start letting your heart wander off into these gorgeous meadows, these beautiful green pastures where he leads you. <laughs> That's where he leads you, if you would but be led. So come to the leading, the scriptures. How about prophecy? Please talk about how God is feeling and how people are behaving so often. Hosea 14, 1, I opened it to. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Oh Lord, search me. Search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, I am sorry. I'm sorry for the sin that's been in my life today. Lord, I will bring my words. I'll bring the turning of my heart away from my sin and I'm going to come to you. I want to be like this. I want to respond to this call of your spirit to your people. It wasn't just to that ethnic grouping of Jews. This is to me, because all scripture is inspired and it's profitable for teaching and correction and training in righteousness for me. So Lord, let that smite my soul, that verse. Lord, let it smite me so I might be changed, so I might be truly clean before a holy God. Then you can open a gospel. I open it at Luke 15, 17. When he came to his senses, he said, and I stopped there and I thought, wow. When he came to his senses, oh God of heaven, let me never be so deluded by my pride, by my sin, by my rebellion, by my lust and my greed, by the motives, the double motives of my heart, Lord, that I, I'm not in my right mind. Lord, let me ever be in my right mind. Let me come to my senses before you and realize where Father's house always is. Lord, if I've drifted at all today, I come back. Let me be in my right mind. I will be one whose senses are awakened to discern good and evil, whose senses are exercised to know good and evil. I'm coming home. I may have just turned slightly, Lord, but I'm turning back. Maybe I've turned all the way around, but I'm turning all the way back. You can pray anything from the scriptures. How about the epistles? I open to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that today, today, right now, this second, 
as I strive to focus my thoughts back on you. Today is the day of salvation for me in every respect, soul, spirit, mind, body, emotion. Today, Lord, you have, in the time of my favor, I heard you, Lord, I accept that, I receive that. I trust you that when I pray, you hear me. This is the time of your favor, Lord. You said so in the Bible. I believe it. I don't feel it, but I believe it, I choose. And you can pray and push through that hedge of doubt and drive yourself through that hedge of unbelief until you reach that place of rest and you lie down next to the still waters. The Lord is able then to commune with you because you're not screaming and running around and not listening. You're able to come to rest in him and peace. How about apocalyptic literature? I open Revelation, Revelation 12, verse 10. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. You can pray that. Lord God, my accuser, my condemnation has, has just been dealt with. You, Lord, have been great and mighty. You have availed for me in your work of atonement. I thank you. You've dealt with the accuser. He cannot accuse me any longer. And then poetry. You could open Psalm 23, and I tell you, I did this earlier this week. And every single phrase I prayed with all my heart. The Lord, the Lord, just stop. The Lord, Yahweh, I am that I am. He's talking to me now. The Lord. Jacob, it says he, he bowed his head over his staff and he worshipped when he blessed the two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. I bowed my head. I said, Lord, you're speaking to me now. You just begin to pray that. Is my shepherd. Lord, what is a shepherd? Just let your mind think. Don't just rush through the verses. What does a shepherd do? He protects sheep. He protects sheep from themselves. He hooks them when they're trying to hurl themselves off a cliff. He puts them back on their feet when they fall on their back because they can't get themselves over. That's how dumb a sheep is, Lord. I'm glad that you are my shepherd. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have chosen to shepherd me, that you have chosen to pastor me. You are my great pastor. You watch over me in the night hours. You lie across the doorway of the sheepfold so that nothing can get me. Nothing can by any means hurt me. And you see what happens is you begin to meditate. This is what David did. He meditated, he chewed. That's what I'm doing now. I'm just chewing over this in front of you. Scriptures begin to occur to you. Oh, John 10, 9, I am the door. What does that mean? That means he lay across the opening. That's what Jesus meant. Wow, Lord, you protect me. You keep me. You guide me. You lead me to pastures. You take me, Lord, when I follow you to places where there's food for my soul. So I will follow you. Thank you. I shall not be in want. Who could do this? Who could... Who could ensure that I never wanted for anything? Only he could. Only the Lord, only the great I am could do this. I shall never be in want, but Lord, I feel like I'm in want. There's something I want. Ah, well, the great shepherd is leading you to that place of fulfillment. He's leading you to the still waters. It might be rough now, it might be a difficult crossing, but he's leading you to still and peaceful waters. Trust him. Lord, I trust you. Start to pray, Lord, I do trust you. You said I won't be in want. And I have this desire in my heart. I have this longing. My heart's been broken by someone. I, 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 need, I need your provision. I need healing for my, my boy. I trust you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Lord, thank you for the food. Thank you for the provision. Thank you, do you know, thank you, Lord, that I have never wanted for a meal. Physically. Thank you, Lord, that I have never been destitute, maybe by my own choosing, but Lord, you've always 
enabled me. And that's not the same for all of your children around the world. Some of them have been struggling, but Lord, in their souls, you speak to any of the Chinese underground church. You speak to any of those dear precious sisters and brothers in the Pakistani underground church or in northern Nigeria, hiding from Boko Haram, I tell you, they will smile at you like the sunshine of heaven because God has satisfied their souls. Lord, I want to be like them. Lord, help me to not take all this for granted. Help me to understand, Lord, where true riches lie. Lord, let my heart be detached. Let, let me let you lead me to the true food, the bread that can't be bought with money. He leads me beside quiet waters. Lord, thank you for the peace that you left with us. I'm reminded of the Gospels when he spoke to his disciples before his, his passion and he said, my peace I leave with you. It's not the peace the world leaves. It's a different kind of peace. Lord, thank you that you've left me that peace. I choose to lie down. I choose to rest in the peace that you've given me instead of fretting and controlling and orchestrating and manipulating events. I lie down, I take my hands off, please forgive me. He restores my soul. <laughs> Maybe you could say to the Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired in soul, I'm weary. I've been struggling. I've been struggling for years maybe. Well, Lord, you restore my soul. And I open up my whole soul to you now. And I ask you to restore my soul. Renew your work in my soul. Renew your work in these days. And let's begin to pray that with faith and trust and belief that the Lord, the great I am, is your shepherd. It changes everything. This makes prayer totally different. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Oh Lord, you know, if you didn't guide, I would wander so much. I do, I'm prone to wander, as the hymn writer says, but Lord, tie me to the horns of the altar. Lord, I, I keep getting on and saying, Lord, here's my life. Here's all my possessions. Here's all my reputation. Here's all my stuff. But then I keep getting off. And I keep holding it again. I keep taking back the reins. Lord, restore my soul and guide me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Lord, I want you to lead me. I want you to be my anchor and my stay. And I choose to put all my faith in you. I choose not to fear. I choose to take courage. I choose to stand on your promises. You said you won't forsake me. And as you pray, start to recite the promises of God. You say, well, I can't remember hardly any of them. Well, if you have to, get on a search engine, okay, one of these new ones, and search for all the promises of God. They'll be there. You can cheat and get a list ready made for you. Go down that list and pray that list. Say the list, preach the list to yourself. This will change your prayer life. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod, your it's sort of more like a club. It fights off beasts, predators. And your staff, it's, it's for guiding me, it's for counting me, it's for, it's for hooking me when I'm about to run into that barbed wire fence, which I keep doing. Lord, they comfort me because I trust your discipline. I trust your training. I trust you, Lord. In fact, I choose again today to put my trust in you because I won't be embarrassed. I won't be ashamed I did. I want you to lead me with your rod and your staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh Lord, there's a whole host of hell that hates me. And yet in the face of all that, you bless me. You allow me to meet with the saints. You allow me to sing your praises with the people that love you. Lord, what a privilege is this? What a feast is this for me in the presence of all the demons of hell, in the presence of Satan himself, you bless me. I feel privileged, I'm honored, I love you. You'll find that as you do this, the love that God has already shed abroad in your heart will just begin to boil and bubble 
and overflow. And then you begin to enter into communion with your maker. All the distractions just melt away. The things of earth do grow strangely dim. They, they just disappear and it's just you and you know you have an audience in the throne room of grace. You know that he hears you. You know that he's always extended that scepter of mercy to you, like Queen Esther. He's always extended that scepter. It's never withdrawn from you. You're his beloved. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Lord, you have anointed me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, just as you promised, this promise is for your children and your children's children and all who are far off. I'm one of the far off ones that the prophet Joel was talking about and that Peter talked about on the day of Pentecost. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me again today. Just fill me again. Every day, I want to be filled with the bubbling, fiery passion of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the holiness of the King. Surely, certainly, goodness. Just think about that. Certainly, goodness will follow me. Goodness. The goodness of God will follow me. The goodness of God. He's good to me. Lord, you're good to me. Do you see, you could, you could be going two hours on this and be lost. So you end up not eating a meal. It happens to me all the time. People say, do you fast? I say, not deliberately. I'm not good at fasting. I don't like it. But I end up so often caught away in his presence, in his, his beauty, really, his nature and his kindness that I don't, I don't really want to stop. And surely your love will follow me. Oh, I'm beloved. I'm accepted in the beloved one. In Christ, I am accepted. I have this love pursuing me like a lion all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that I will be in your house. Lord, thank you that I will be with you forever and ever and ever, world without end. I shall be uttering holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. I shall be uttering worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me. He shouldn't have been. Lord, I shall dwell with you forever, but you will keep me in your bosom for eternity. I tell you, you start to commune with your maker. Just meditate. If you don't know how to pray, open the Bible. Just start praying it. And you'll find that you're starting to commune. If you really struggle, just start in Psalms. It's the easiest place to start. And pray every word, pray every phrase, pray every sentence. So I really hope and pray that this has been a helpful study in how to pray, really how to begin to pray using scripture as your basis. And of course, there'll be times when you pray spontaneously. There'll be times when you can pray to music, uh, singing, where there's a, a beautiful hymn or some worship music that's being played. And you can use those words as, as the basis of a prayer. But if you struggle with prayer, and it is a big, big problem in the church globally, then just start coming back to scripture and use that as your basis and really meditate in every word and every phrase and every sentence of any part of the Bible and just pour your heart out to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance other scriptures and other parts of scripture that join together to create this beautiful communion with your maker. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would make these words living to every hearer. Lord, that you would open every heart and teach every heart to be able to pray. Lord, to be able to truly commune with you. Oh Lord, that is the highest of all expressions for the human heart. To be able to talk as a friend to a friend with our maker. Lord, I ask you to make this a reality in every soul. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.